Hello everyone, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Today's show is about travelling, so... We have invited two great travellers from our country, Sergi Vicente and Gabi Martinez, both journalists and writers. We will also have with us one of the most swinging voices of the moment, the talented, beautiful and brave Andrea Motis. And of course, we will also have a debate. Patricia Scalona and Matthew Tree are going to tackle a fundamental issue for travellers. Backpack or suitcase? Make yourself comfortable and turn up the volume on the device you're using, because this show starts now. Hello and welcome again to a new edition of the Weekly Mag on La Charcha. Today we are talking about travelling, with a host of experts from far and near, some further than others, just like our Mr. Stereotype, Mark Roderick. Hello, Mark. What's Welcome back. Thanks very much. What's the crack, Marcella? Crack. Yes. Crack? What's crack? You've never heard this expression before. Well, I've heard house tricks. Yes. How's it going? Well, Irish, we Hiya. say... Hiya. We say, what's the crack? Or how's the crack? Okay, explain that. Okay, so crack, crack is not like a, a hole in the ground or, you know, crack cocaine, excuse me. Crack is C-R-A-I-C, and in Ireland we use it to say fun. Fun. So it's like, what's the crack? How's the crack? Any crack? Mm-hmm. Just right. you, if you had traveled and to Ireland... And what am I supposed to answer in, uh, the Irish, uh, in the Irish way? Not much. Not, not much? much? Not much. Okay. Exactly, not, not much. much. So if you, basically it's a little cultural thing that, you know, if you travel to Ireland and spend the time there, you'll learn, you'll learn about that. So just okay. Use it today. Thanks for the language lesson. There you go. That's today we here. talk about traveling. Yes. One of my favorite topics, one of my top hobbies even, I would say. Yes, because you've visited many countries. I think I was counting last night. I think I'm closing in about between 30 and 35 countries. Mm, that's which quite is a not lot. bad. I'm 35 bad. years old, pretty much a country a not year. Not bad. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, not bad. Okay. And uh, we shot a great video this week about one of my uh, best, uh, my favorite topics, which is train travel. Love trains. Train travel. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Shall we watch it? Sure. Let's give it a go. Excellent. Let's see. <sighs> Traveling, adventure, experiences, excitement, the Orient Express, the Trans-Siberian Railway. Today we're going to go to Barcelona San Cugat, one of the oldest trains in Spain. I think it's about 101 years old. Let's go. Excitement, I cannot wait. The next train doesn't take any passengers. It might take me though. Do you think if I stand in this circle, they'll beam me up like in Star Trek? Beam me up, Scotty. That would be an awesome way of traveling. A lot faster than a train, I guess. If you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you travel and why? Colombia right now, probably. For the coke, sorry, for the cocoa powder or the coffee? Not for the cocoa powder, for music and uh, people dancing and all of this. I will travel to Bali, Indonesia. Oh, like my t-shirt. Oh yeah, exactly. Australia and New Zealand and Tasmania. I will probably go to San Diego because I went there a few uh, months ago and I really like it, but I just could spend there two weeks. Did you go to Tijuana when you were in San Diego? Yes, of course. <laughs> How it, did you know? Is it true that there's sexo marijuana in Tijuana? <laughs> it's a song, I'm joking. I think I would go to Japan because I think there's a very different, very different culture. Do you like Japanese food? No. <laughs> I'm not old or pregnant. I think I better move to another seat. What's the worst travel experience you've ever had? That was when I was on a school trip to Belgium. Is this the fact that the Dutch and the Belgians don't like each other that you said this? I must say there is some tension between Dutch and it's Belgians. Like the Catalans and the Spanish. But it's it's worse between Dutch and Germans. It was Heathrow maybe in London and I was running late. We missed the plane. And where did you have to sleep? On the, uh, on the hotel nearby the, airpla the, the airport. Life is so tough, huh, traveling? I know, I know, I know. Playing Candy Crush on the train. 
I, ca I can't ask you any questions, no? If you're a, a Western person going out in Shanghai, it's amazing because you can enter everywhere for free. All the drinks are for free as well. But don't you think that the fact that you're a woman, you got everything for free? It wasn't the fact that you were white? Uh, no, because even some guys who were also traveling with us, they also got all the drinks for free. So, so there's a big gay scene in Shanghai. <laughs> This train trip has changed my life profoundly. I think I'm going to go on a spiritual and personal journey. The nomadic life is for me, but first I'll have to collect some money, I think. Sorry, can you give me some money for my trip? Sorry, can you give me some money for my trip? Maybe I'll have to actually sing or do something first. Okay, that was interesting indeed. It mm? was. Uh, I love trains. My family has a fascination with trains. In fact, my family has a fascination with traveling in general. It kind of mm. runs in our blood. When did you start traveling? When I was three. Three? Yes. Yeah? I remember it. You remember? I remember it like it was yesterday, even mm -hmm. though it was 32 years ago. Um, basically, my parents took me on a bicycle, right? On a bicycle. From yes. Galway, which is in the west of Ireland. They cycled all the way across Ireland. They got on the boat, cycled all the way across Wales, England, and they arrived in Paris. Mm. That's a uh, very uh, brisk, you know, I would no, say. No, it was, it was awesome. All I, all I remember, actually, for a couple of years later, I couldn't sit properly, but you know, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 bike itself, the biking itself, I'm sure, was wonderful. Unfortunately, we had no Instagram or cameras at that time, so I have no actual pictures of it, but that was my first experience traveling on the mm -hmm. bicycle and the train. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was awesome. Let's move on because there's something I wanted to talk about as regards traveling was like the dangers of traveling. Mm -hmm. People have these... That's a good one. It is, yeah, because people get all nervous. No, as soon as they leave the comfort zone of their house and they head out into the big world, no, they have all of these preconceived ideas of danger, no, of what danger is. Well, let's take a couple of ideas, for example, okay? So, uh, when I've traveled, I've traveled in many different countries, okay? I've been to China, I've been to Russia, I've been to Iran. You might call it like the access of evil but it wasn't that dangerous. I've been robbed more times in Barcelona and had more experiences, bad experiences there than I did in those countries. So, mm. absolute stereotype. Mm. I would say that I they see. are safer than, than, than traveling here. Mm -hmm. um, the most dangerous uh, holiday you remember? Benidorm. Have you been there? No. No? You're lucky. <laughs> it's scary down there. It's dangerous. It's like, you know, downtown Beirut in the 1990s, just full of English bars. No, I'm exaggerating. I'm kidding. But that will, just, that, that will just tell you how, how dangerous... The world is not a dangerous place. The further away you get from a civilization, the more civilized the people are. I know, but you, I said the most dangerous experience you had. <sighs> Ah, I have if a good one. Any, I, di I did indeed. I once got involved in a dodgy poker game in Beijing. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I remember it clearly because I used to play poker here, right? And poker here is easy. You sit around, you, you, know, you make some roast chickens, you have some brandies, you play poker. In China, I remember being stuck in a bar, drinking whiskey, and I almost had to put my kidney down as the last bet. I'd run out of money. It was a really dangerous experience, uh -huh. but I managed to get that out of it. That sounds like okay. a movie. It, it, it was Mark's movie, Mark's life. <laughs> <laughs> it is like a movie. And also, uh, the, speaking of China, do you, do you know what the three T's are? The three T's? Yeah. The three T's. You know, Honestly, it, no. You got the three Why A's, you, you got us? the triple A batteries, okay? So I'm going to tell you about the three T's, okay? Okay. So in China, there are three things that you don't talk about with people, okay? Mm -hmm. The three T's. Which are? One, Tibet, for obvious reasons. Okay. Taiwan, again, for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. and toilets. Mm -hmm. Again, we go to scatologic humor. Well, this is why I'm here. We're supposed to compare the, 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 the stereotypes. Well, in China, they don't talk about the toilets like they talk about them here. Do you know why? Have you been to a toilet in China? Obviously, you haven't been to China, I imagine. <laughs> no. Okay, so we all, a toilet in China, first of all, there are no doors. So you're in the restaurant. Well, I can't believe there. that all toilets in China are without doors. There are. You go there and you'll find out. And hmm. I can guarantee you, there are no doors. Okay. They are mixed. So it doesn't matter whether you're doing number one or number two. You're there with Maria and John and 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 Hun Chi and Mr. Chang. Everybody's together in the toilet, and there's nothing covering anything. Mm -hmm. So it's. 
it, nobody talks about it. Well, it's like you go there, well, anyway, it's like what happens in China stays in China. I think you are taking advantage of the fact that I haven't been to China and you are exaggerating again. So let's move on to the next topic. Fair enough. Which is? Food, maybe? Food? Uh, yeah. I like something that. More, uh, something uh, nicer maybe than talking about yes. poo. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite adventurous when I travel, okay? And I, and I love to dive into local you culture. You like to try eat. everything. Of course, absolutely. I even I'll tell you a story in a few minutes. I even hunt my own food. So, strangest <laughs> thing. You hunt your own food. I'll tell you in a minute. Hold, hold on. We'll, get, we'll okay. get to that one in a the second. The thing with right? Mark, we never know when he's exaggerating or he's inventing stuff. So, you just need to guess. I mm, I'll leave it up to you. Tell the truth. Of course. This is why. Well, I'm not going to okay. continue that sentence. <laughs> um, okay, so food. Strangest thing I've ever eaten, okay? So, mm. I was in Laos, okay? And went to this. We got invited to this lovely house for this Buddhist ritual, okay? Now, when you go to another country, you kind of have to do what they say because, you know, it's kind of maybe, you know, for respect and all exactly. of that. Exactly, and education. Of course, and education. Mm. If you invite somebody into your house and you offer them a pam tomacket or you offer them a, 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 a sausage with beans or whatever you have here, a paella, they feel obliged to eat it. Well, I was invited into this house in Laos and I sit down in this wonderful feast and they bring out the main plate which is like oh wow this is going to be absolutely amazing do you know what it was um, it, it no was, it was a recently killed snake in congealed pig's blood <laughs> And now everybody was looking at you. You're sitting at the head of the table. You put this plate in front of you. You can see a, a, a bit of a snake just bobbing along in this congealed pig's blood. And you think to yourself, mm -hmm. Mark, how so the hell did you, did you get here? What did you do? I ate it like a champion. And I, and I and I well late, later later probably went out back and got rid of it. But uh, it, it, you know you have to keep but up appearances. But what about snails? What do you think about snails? Snails. You asked me snails. You know, here it's a Lleida speciality, a Catalan ah. speciality. Um, snails, uh, you asked me before, what's the most exotic thing I've ever eaten? That might be for me, snails. Interesting. Okay, uh, if you offer snails to Irish people, they will look at you if, if you've got ten heads. They said, those snails are supposed to be in the garden doing their jobs. Actually, I have a joke about a snail. So you don't you eat week. snails in Ireland? We don't eat snails in Ireland. They're a little bit like, actually I tasted them once, they're a little bit like uh, gambas, like me. Uh, prawns, excuse me, prawns from the sea. Yeah, because you've got sunburned again. Exactly, and I have... You need to be more careful. And uh, before uh, finishing, let me ask okay, you something. Okay, yes. Um, what would you recommend to somebody from here, to a Catalan who wants to visit Ireland and has just a weekend? I would fly into Dublin. Yes. I would get a train to the Blarney Stone. I would kiss the Blarney Stone, which allegedly gives you the gift of the gab, which you can all look up at this afterwards. Then I would head to the Guinness factory. I would have the best pint of Guinness ever. And then I would go to church. Real authentic Irish experience and maybe do some dancing as well, like I showed you a couple of weeks ago. And then I would fly back. Okay. And I have one last thing to tell you before you kick me off the stage again. Or off uh, the yes, set. very I'm quickly joking. because we don't have too much time. It's though. okay. So, very quickly, traveling. What I found out about traveling. Traveling makes you more social. Better at conversation, as you can see. Mm -hmm, makes more sense. confident, mm -hmm. more adaptable. Yes. More adventurous, like eating snake uh -huh. and pig's uh, congealed blood. Uh, more easygoing, which mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. That's like a description of yourself. And sexier. Sexier. Yeah. Mm, interesting. You've traveled a lot, no, Marcella? <laughs> not as much as you have. Um, well, Mark, thanks so much for coming today. It's no been uh, really interesting as usual. Are you coming My back pleasure. next week or back you are on holiday? Back next week to make you laugh. No, no, back next week to make you laugh. Excellent. Yep. We'll be waiting for you. No problem. Today we're talking about travelling. So I wanted to tell you about one of my last trips in Australia. So I was with a friend and we decided that we wanted to go on holiday together, take a bit of time from work. And in America, they call it go on vacation. Now we had about a fortnight to travel and a fortnight is two weeks. So we decided, why don't we go to New Zealand? Now I'm not sure if you know this, but Australia and New Zealand have different currencies. So we have Australian dollars and then there are New Zealand dollars. So my friend, he was responsible for changing the money over and I was responsible for planning the route throughout the country. What cities we were going to go to and which places we were going to visit. 
Now we decided we weren't going to fly to New Zealand, we were going to take a cruise because a cruise would give us a great opportunity to relax. Now, we like to consider ourselves as spontaneous people, so we didn't want to get an all-inclusive package. Now, that's a package where they plan all your meals and your drinks and everything. We wanted to be a bit flexible. Now, when it came to the day of boarding, that's the day when you get onto the ship, my friend was nowhere to be seen. He forgot to set his alarm and he missed the boat. So I decided, well, I was going to do a solo trip. Now, the only problem was I didn't have any money. So as soon as I got to New Zealand, the first place I went was a currency exchange office and I exchanged my Australian dollars into New Zealand dollars. And I had a great time. I hope you enjoyed the story. And until next time, I'll see you. Traveling opens up the world to you. Most people like traveling, and today we've invited two real travelers who'll share their experiences with us. But first, I suggest you take a look at this glossary where you'll find words that can help you follow this interview. The first concept that will appear during the interview is to deport. If a government deports someone, it expels them from the country, either because they have committed a crime or because the government thinks they do not have the right to be there. The second word you need to know is toss. If you toss something somewhere, you throw it there lightly, often in a rather careless way. For example, you toss a coin into a fountain in order to make a wish. Third word to pay attention to, open-minded. An open-minded person is someone who has no prejudices and therefore is receptive to new ideas or arguments. And that leads us to our last concept, comfort zone. Your comfort zone is the situation or position in which you feel safe, comfortable or in control. However, if you are willing to travel, you may need to leave it. Sergio Vicente went to China for three weeks and finally he spent there 12 years as the TV3 correspondent. His wife and two children are Chinese. Now they live in Catalonia and he is the uh, BTV director. Gabi Martinez is one of the most popular travel writers in our country. Although his latest book doesn't really deal with travel literature, but with the story of a neurologist who was the victim of a misdiagnosis. Well, Gabi Martinez, Sergi Vicente, welcome to the program. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, uh, let's start with Sergi. In your um, book, Sergi, called China Fast Forward, you state that everything in China goes faster. So tell us, why do you think this is happening? Well, China has, uh, has lived uh, and is still living a profound transformation. But unlike uh, all the transformations in history of humanity, this is happening in a very, uh, at a very accelerated path. So, so I, I wanted to put that idea in the title, in the, book in the book's title, because uh, for me it's one of the main factors that, that, that make China, um, Chinese uh, transformation different than, than, than what we see in other parts of the world. And, and that's the same way I lived it personally. Uh, my 12 years and a half in China um, passed by very fast and, and, and this book is about personal things too. Mm -hmm. What made you stay there for? 12 years. Yeah, the original true. idea was just three weeks, so what happened? Yeah, it, 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 was, it was originally for three weeks. I actually had the return ticket that I never used. I still keep it at home. But um, I, once I was there, I realized I, 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 I couldn't have enough with three weeks because that was uh, an extraordinary country with a lot of things to say, uh, to, to tell to the Catalan audience. I wanted to, to work as a journalist, which is my, my major. I arrived there with an excuse, with, with, which was a, a visa to teach English. They wanted foreign faces. It was not important that wow. I was not a native speaker, but, but, uh, but they wanted to see a foreign face in a, in a school like that. I see. And, and, and then I had the chance to work for TV3 and I stayed there for, for such a long time afterwards. Yeah. Sounds fascinating. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and Gabi, in your books, you portray many countries such as Pakistan, China, Central Africa, America, uh, Spain. Uh, tell us, um, do you write stories to travel or you travel to write stories? I am in the middle. I don't know exactly because when I write, I think I feel the same that when I am uh, traveling. So it's difficult for me to, to try one or other option. Would you call yourself an adventurer? 
the adventure is, is to write because really when I stay in my, in my room writing, I feel like an adventure because if you don't feel the thing that you are writing, it's difficult to communicate the, these feelings. No? So I think for, for me, the, the definition the, to, to tell who is a, an adventurer or a traveler, for me is, is difficult. It's the what same. Was, what was the first uh, travel the first that travel. made you write about it? It was to Morocco, but before, for me, it was very important to travel to in interrail, the the travels that you can uh, do with with the train. And after this, I discovered that I wanted to uh, to communicate the, the the things that I was looking for because I didn't find the uh, histories that I was looking for. I see uh, in books because I I think um, I wanted to find in, in Spanish or in Catalan the same histories that I was uh, f uh, meeting in English or in other languages. So uh, I began to uh, write a, a collection of books with other writers that they also uh, traveled. And, uh, and finally we, we published uh, eight books about interrail uh, they say that travel, uh, traveling opens your mind. What would you say um, about the effects that traveling has had on your mind, on your minds and lives? Uh, I think it helps you understand yourself better, that's for sure. Um, but I'd like to distinguish between traveling and tourism, which is what we normally associate to traveling. And, and, and for me, uh, tourism is about relaxing and not so much about discovering a country, which is what I'm really interested in when, when I go to other places. Journalism is, a, is, a, is actually a great excuse to, to discover other countries. You're not going to see many touristic spots. You're not, going to talk, you're not going to take those photos that everyone has, but at least you're going to, you're going to um, interact with the, with the local people and, and, and I think understand the, the, the culture better and, and, and get a deeper experience, which, which is uh, uh, fascinating in, in in many cases, especially for those countries that are less known. I remember, um, although, although I was uh, expelled, I was deported from, from Myanmar because I, I got the visa, with, I got a tourist visa and I, I went there to do a journalistic work and once the police uh, found out, uh, uh, they expelled me. But, but <laughs> the, the three days... That sounds that I, a bit risky. Uh, yeah, well, journalism sometimes uh, is a bit risky. Especially <laughs> in, in, in China. In some countries. That happened in, in Burma, in Myanmar. But, um, even if it was only three days, I thought Burma was a fascinating country because it's not as known as other places in Southeast Asia, for example. And, and, and I had the feeling, well, I have to go back there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do so because I'm probably in the blacklist. But in China, we're talking about risky experiences. Um, actually, you were arrested a few times. That happened and it's what, what hap normally happens in a place that has no freedom of expression. They don't like journalists. Um, at the wrong place, at the right, at the wrong time, or, or the other way around. I don't know how to put it. But um, at, we don't have to imagine me behind bars. That never happened, for example, or handcuffed. That never ha happened. But of course, uh, working in a place like China is full of obstacles, and and um, it's it's probably not as risky as working in a European country uh, uh, where you have huge demonstrations with violence, for example, anti-riot police, where even people could die. I think I have to say that. But because, because I think China is a very safe country, but of course it's not a pleasant thing that, that you get arrested or detained. Of course. Police. Mm. Um, what about you? Maybe in China, but because my my friend, the, the man who was traveling with me, he said that he was going to kill me. Maybe, maybe. but it was after. It's necessary to explain that he was a Chinese, a Chinese boy, who was discovering the coast of China. Uh, traveling with me because he was living uh, in the inner China and th there was two very hard experiences for, for him and after to discover that the, the communism it wasn't exactly that he thought it was and after to discover for example that it, it exists the prostitution for example also the call that we received every night at the hotel about uh, do you know uh, do you want a message and every night uh, I, I say that, that not, 
but he he told me that it it wasn't the the thing that it seems. So this night, I told him that maybe we can say to the to the girls that okay, we want a massage. So this day um, we opened the door. They arrived there. They entered, and they wanted to they, to to make sex with us. So. He was virgin at this moment. He, ha he was 21 years old. After this, he told me that maybe I had helped him to do a thing that he didn't want to do. So he began to, to, to be more excited every time. And finally, he silenced me, telling that I am going to kill you. It's a long history, maybe uh, we have no time to develop. You describe these anecdotes in your books? Yes. Okay, so yes, we'll, maybe yeah. we'll have to read the book to, yeah. to uh, find the exactly. whole story. We need to have a short break now, but we'll continue talking about okay. uh, traveling. I'll leave you with a quote uh, by an American author who won the Nobel Prize in Literature and a Pulitzer Prize, John Steinbeck. See you in a minute. Well, here we are again. The main subject of today's show is traveling, which is why we have two great travelers on the set, Sergi Vicente and Gabi Martinez. We are going to chat with them about trips, but first, let me introduce our collaborator, Ana Priscila Magrinha. Ana Priscila. Hiya. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Well, we always like to joke with Ana Priscilla. Uh, people, some people like, uh, you know, to collect stamps, uh, cars, uh, whatever, but Ana Priscilla likes to uh, collect uh, information. She's like the Catlin Bill Bryson. Thank you very much. I don't know <laughs> if Bill Bryson agrees with that, but I definitely really like him. I collect data, I collect information, and today, since we have two great travelers with us, I want to talk a little bit about uh, traveling, and maybe they can give us some tips. And I, I want to start with one big thing, packing. Mm -hmm. Packing. I don't know if you are any good at packing. If That's you like a big packing. issue. I'm the worst person when it comes to packing. I hate it. I always leave it until the last moment. Mm, then uh, you are a little bit like me. My mom always said, you have to do things at the very first moment. Packing is an important thing. I always leave it until the last moment. And I always grab things that at the end of the trip I haven't used. So my fear is when I have to travel and I have to take a plane, you go there, they have a scale, and they check if your luggage weighs too much. And if it weighs too much, ka-ching, ka-ching, you have to pay more. <laughs> um, last okay, year... Okay, but let's ask Sergi <laughs> and Gabi if they are good at packing. I I'm, bet you are. I'm a complete disaster. <laughs> I, I always thought I had to get a bag ready for natural disasters um, coverage. Coverages, um, but whenever they happen, I was definitely not ready, and and I always left it for the last time, and I always forget something, and I always had to buy things in the middle of the way, so um, I admit I'm totally messed mm. up. What about you, Gabi? I let it also for the last time, but because I don't take a lot of things every day, I think I need uh, less things. It's uh, like a, a typical uh, discourse, but it's real, really. I don't travel with practical. Always, I the only need I need is a backpacker, a mm -hmm. backpacker to to sleep because I need to sleep if it's possible in a bed. Yeah, mm -hmm. but and three things know. that have to be in your suitcase, in your backpack when you're traveling. Maybe a toothbrush or something like that. I don't know. Three main things that always have to be there when you're traveling. Uh, yeah. Go first. Maybe a light because if you are moving on the night, do you need it? The toothbrush, uh, also. And a hat. A hat? A hat. Oh. Yeah. Because okay. if not, the, the hat, uh, usually uh, a hat, but it depends on, on, the, on the zone. If you is a cold zone with to, uh, to protect the airs, and if not, something to, if, if you go to a zone with a lot of sun, something to 
don't to protect, to cover yeah, your to protect your own heart. Out. I'm a little bit romantic. I still like maps. I, 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 I like to understand where I am. And, and even, even though today we have uh, GPS and mobile phones that we can consult it anytime, anywhere, we have coverage everywhere. But still, a map is a very useful tool. And if you have to work uh, when, when you go to these places, duct tape is a very useful thing. Oh. Uh, sometimes uh, robes, or, uh, these are things that you don't necessarily are going to find in certain countries. Although in China you have all kind of junk and you can buy them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, air, water or land? Do you have a favorite mode of transportation or mm -hmm. Let's see, means like of transport. Stand? Everyone. It doesn't matter. Anything. Yeah. 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 Although, this, of course, the slower the better because then you can, you know, you can get things on the way, you can, you can learn on the way. If you go too fast, um, you just don't see anything, basically. And, and I, I, I have a question. I don't know, Marcella, if you have ever been in a flight when you land, that people start clapping, just like, thank God we are alive. <laughs> I don't know if you're the ones who like to clap. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the kind of person that thinks, well, if anything has to happen, I, I'm not going to suffer. I, if I have to die, I, I you know, I'm you're ready say, okay, for it. I enjoyed it. That's so. all, folks. But, but that doesn't mean that I like risk. And, and if you see a risk, you have to avoid. We just talked about transportation ways. And I think uh, one of the worst ways of transportation in China is, uh, is the bus, the long distance, distance bus. Oh, yeah? oh. Especially in mountainous areas where, where, where safety is a big issue. And I remember in some stations, they even have, they even have posters of, and photos with, with accidents and victims of the accident with very explicit images. And that, that was very shocking. And it was shocking to see how uh, some buses they have beds, like horizontal um, ways of uh, letting people in. Yeah. And, and when, when I had to go in those, it was, it was very, very hard to, you know, to, you know, to go all the way with sharing not only a very short distance with the other passengers, but sleeping there and, and knowing that all those, you know, metallic structures inside, if anything happened, were that dead sentence almost. Sorry to be so, you know, so dark, no, no. but that was a, a very shocking thing. When we talk about uh, uh, risky, disturbing situations, well, uh, we need to mention food. Food is, uh, is, uh, can be very exotic in, and depending on the country. So uh, have you found ourselves in the situation when you had or you were offered a really, you know, unusual or disturbing uh, kind of food? I committed a big mistake in oh. Africa, in Uganda because I drank a, a glass of milk uh -huh. of a ship that I don't know where, where was the, the ship before, but after this, I, <clears throat> I felt ill of dysentery oh. Oh. for a long time there. And it was because I, I wanted to take something natural mm -hmm. <laughs> from the people Local from there, yes. and, but this milk, it wasn't good. So, but sometimes if you want to take a risk, maybe uh, you have good luck, but maybe not. And for me, this, this moment is, uh, was uh, very clear that you must be careful with your decisions. Next time you will think twice before accepting, uh, depending uh, on uh, what uh, kind of food, right? What about uh, you, Sergi? Yeah, I think, I think it's important to have information about what kind of things you can find there and, and what But have you ever tried something uh, uh, very uh, special like insects or shark or I, something I, like that? I was not very eager to eat insects. Actually, the first time that I ate insects was in, in, in Catalonia and I, I actually liked them. And I, for, I, I actually um, I thought that um, it, it was a bad thing that I didn't try them before because I, I think they're very tasty. Yeah, they say they're very tasty. I'm not gonna try them. I'm sorry. I've never <laughs> tried them. <laughs> but uh, if I, you say that, I believe you. <laughs> I, I tried the little crickets, and, and they, they tasted like artichoke. I think that they're very oh, nice. Artichokes. Um, but I tried like um, horse milk in Mongolia. It's 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 it's, it's very sour, but it's, it's it's a good thing. I tried um, goat eyes in Beijing. Uh, goat crocodile, eyes. Yeah. Wow. Crocodile in Suzhou, um, and probably some other things. But um, I think you have to go with an open mind. But again, yeah, you need to have information because you could. Well, like Selfie is open to everything. Yeah, I'm quite an open-minded <laughs> person. Yeah. What about language? 
I mean, um, language is a great way to uh, to make friends, to get to know new people, and establish communication with locals. Has language ever been an impediment for you in uh, the countries you visited? But it is an impediment if you don't know the language, and, and then you need filters, you need people to help you out. You need uh, translators, fixers, we call them in, in, in the journalistic uh, okay. slang. But um, I think, I think the only effort to try to know a few words is, um, is a very interesting exercise because that, the, the local people normally welcome you much better because they see that you have a positive attitude towards them. You make them. an effort. Yeah, you, 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 you try to, to, I don't know, to leave your footprint, not, not as a tourist with your, with, with your waist and, and, and your, you know, your... Like when singers come to Barcelona and they say, Bona nit Barcelona, and everybody's <laughs> like, yeah! They learned a little bit of Catalan. They yeah, did try to get that connection. It's always a good thing. So how long did it take you to learn Chinese? I first studied in Barcelona for one year. I had a very basic Chinese level, but it was a very useful one because um, once there I could um, self-study and, and, you know, year after year my, my, my Chinese got better. And I tried to mix with, with local people. I, from the beginning, I, I knew for sure that I wanted to have a Chinese girlfriend who ended up becoming my wife. And, and yeah, um, but it's not, a, it's not an easy language. It's, it's, it, it needs time. Well, it sounds dedication. very complicated <laughs> for me. It's, yeah, it's, it's very different than our language. And it needs memorization, which needs time. Which needs time. And, and it's not something that you always have when you, when you, for example, work as a journalist in China. But do you practice Chinese uh, now as well? Your wife is Chinese. Yeah, we speak, we speak you Mandarin. You speak Chinese at home? At home? And, and she speaks Mandarin with the kids. We have two kids. Uh, and I speak Catalan to them. So. So we kind of, you know, uh, a little bit like you, I guess. <laughs> yes, exactly. We do the same. Yeah. Well, excellent. Anna Priscilla, I think you have a, a, a one last topic. I just us. wanted to ask them, um, when you travel abroad, uh, there's some uh, traditions that uh, tourists like to do. For instance, if you go to Rome, uh, you like to, people always go to the Fontana de Trevi. Yeah. And when you, you have go to, to you, if you're a Roman, how do they say it in English? Uh, when you go to Rome, do what the Romans do, no? Then, I don't know if the Romans do that, though. <laughs> you have to go to Fontana de Trevi and toss a coin if you want to come back. If you want to do this in Barcelona, if you want to make sure you come back to Barcelona, you just need to drink a little bit of uh, water from, uh, from the canaletas. But in Rome, you need to do that. And they gather uh, 1.5 million of euros every year from mm. that fountain that goes to Caritas. But I don't know if you like to do those kind of touristy traditions or you run away from them? I think I've constructed all my, I've built all my career looking for the places and people who no one is looking them. So the places I like a lot, the desert, for example, the spaces where it's not, uh, the people is not going usually. For me, are the the more important so you haven't thing to travel. you have the coin in the Fontana de Trevi? No, I have never do it, done it, yeah, no. But uh, because I think we, we have a lot of information. We are uh, receiving every day news from every part of the world, but finally the world is not discovered. When you move only, when you go out of your city, you discover that the, you don't know anything practically about the world. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I go to put my point of view there. Okay, so Gabi prefers authentic experiences and tries to run away from touristic uh, places. Well, we'll continue a bit later. Now we're going to some tips uh, because I think it's a good uh, moment to offer our usual language tips. Our teacher Rosie, Rosie Griffin, proposes a few idioms and sayings related to uh, traveling. They might uh, come in handy, so take note. Today we're talking about travel, so let's look at some expressions to do with that. Starting with me. I'm a person who often gets itchy feet. It means I find it difficult to stay in the same place for a long time. I like to move and discover new places. That doesn't mean that I'm living out of a suitcase, permanently traveling from place to place, but that I like to change where I live and really get to know a place well. When I was younger, my teacher told me to reach for the stars, so follow my ambition no matter how high and my ambition has always been to travel the world. 
I was once offered a job in a different country, but I also had a job back at home. I wanted to travel, but my life was at a crossroads. I had to choose between staying or leaving. And my cousin Mel, who's a real pain in the ass, which means that she, her only job is to annoy me, she kept giving me her opinion, telling me why she thought it was a really bad idea. And I told her to stop being such a backseat driver. Her opinion was unwanted and really making me feel nervous. In the end, I decided to take the job to work abroad in another country. I didn't want to miss the boat and miss the opportunity. After all, I'm only two hours away from the UK. It's not like I'm sailing close to the wind, doing something really dangerous, putting my life at risk. But this was bad news for my cousin Mel. And as they say, bad news travels fast. Only last week, I got a phone call from her. She's going to come stay with me here in Barcelona for a month. So I'm starting to get itchy feet again. See you. Well, uh, Rosie just mentioned an interesting idiom, itchy feet. So I would like to ask you, do you uh, get itchy feet um, uh, after a period of not uh, traveling too much? You feel like you need to um, uh, run away from home again? Yeah, but, but, but you can, it, it cannot become frustration because uh, if you don't travel, it's probably because you don't have time or money. But uh, I miss traveling. I don't travel that much anymore. And, and when I was in China, I used to go to many places very often. Mm -hmm. Actually, you've, you've seen the whole of the country, no? In China? Yeah, I've been uh, virtually everywhere in China and also neighboring countries. Um, some like Myanmar or North Korea, which are not, you know, the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. And you, Gabi? You get itchy feet often? Putty feet? Uh, itchy. Sure. Meaning that you uh, need, you feel the need to uh, to travel after a yeah. period that you haven't traveled. Mm. You need to do it uh, again. Mm, no, when I am in a place, I stay okay. But maybe after some time, I, I need to to out of a home. Now, for example, I have spent some time, three months uh, out of home. Now I know I am. I must to to write. It's like the first question you. You did, mm -hmm. no? Okay. Uh, every time has his time. How often do you travel in a year? Uh, twice a year now, but I used to travel twice a month before, at least. Mm -hmm. Do you go back to China a lot? Uh, last time was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was invited to a conference and they paid everything, so it was perfect. <laughs> uh, but if it was not for that, it would probably be a year, a year and a half. Uh, because we still have relatives there, of course, so, so we, we have to go once in a while. Gabi, how often do you travel in a year? Maybe three months, more or less, every year. If I, when I am traveling, if not, maybe I can spend seven months. But usually, if, if we take the first year I began to travel, and now maybe the, the, the media, can be three, three or four months mm -hmm. every year. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. no, not no, bad no, at not all. Bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a Catalan saying, "Coma uh, casa and lloc." In English, uh, something like "There's no place like home." So, uh, is it true in your case? Do you agree with it? I like the combination of uh, comfort and and you know finding your going out of your comfort zone. I, I, I think I like both combined. When I don't have, when I have one thing for a long time, I need the other one. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's pretty much the description that suits me. And you, Priscilla? There's no place like home, but I haven't been traveling for a long time, and now I have itchy feet, and I, I would like <laughs> to travel somewhere, somewhere in the. Where would you like to go? Actually, I would like to go to Greece. I've never been to Greece, so. Mm -hmm. It's not that far away and it has a lot of, well, it's the basic place to go to find the classical culture uh, from Europe, so I really would like to go there. Mm -hmm. And the food. I'm a great fan of Greek cuisine. I'm assuming I love it. it's very mm -hmm. good. Okay, um, I would like to ask uh, both of you about uh, your projects at the moment. Uh, so let's start with uh, Sergio, I would like to ask you about uh, um, your experience directing BTV. But, uh, and the and the main main challenges you have at the moment. The main challenge is uh, to understand that uh, more and more people are watching audiovisual contents, but less TV. And with TV, meaning what we understood before as TV, you know, the, the 
the thing we have in the living room. That, that's, that's something more and more for, for all the generations and younger generations and going to other screens. It doesn't mean that we're, not, that we're not watching content, but we use them in a different way. And um, leading BTV now, what I'm trying to do is uh, to distribute better those contents and letting uh, people access them uh, in a more comfortable way. And that means also targeting different um, uh, ages of people. So uh, that's a big challenge, especially when you don't have a huge budget, like mm -hmm. this is the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm good. not asking for money. Well, maybe I am. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Gabby? What project are you working on at the moment? Now I have two projects. One is, uh, is uh, the name is Invisible Animals. I am looking for animals about the world that is very difficult to look at them. And is um, the beginning of this project was after make a travel to Pakistan and looking, f making a research about a man who was um, killed there. He was on a criminal research where practically I w I was close to be killing real, more, more real than the Chinese uh, boy <laughs> mm -hmm. there. And after this book, I wrote a book about it. It's, it's, uh, the name is In the Land of Giants. And this, this book demonstrates me that you can, if you follow uh, an animal like a yeti, that was the, the reason for the man who was killed was in, in the Pakistan, you can explain the war. So after mm, follow to the Yeti and discover the, these possibilities, I began a project that is, um, because I, I am traveling around the world looking for tiger in Korea, mm -hmm. for the, uh, for the um, uh, Great Barrier Reef, because it's a very big uh, animal that we don't know, but it's the, more, the biggest, uh, animal that we can look in the space is the Great Barrier Reef. Very interesting. Yeah. Anna Priscilla, um, did you know that one of uh, Gabby's um, obsessions, uh, in a good way, is to find out and write about uh, animals that don't exist? No, I didn't know that. Hmm? Um, Pretty interesting. Have, have you gone a good to subject for your books as well. Yeah, it could be. I, I really like the Loch Ness Monster. I don't know if you have ever done any research on that, but that's one of my main obsessions, so <laughs> we could talk about that one day. Well, here in Catalonia we have El Drac de Banyolas. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, anyway, we've got some uh, quick questions, Ana Priscilla, for our guests. So, you want to start? Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, if somebody asks you what you were asking me before, uh, where can I go? Where should I go? A place that people cannot miss. I know that you like secret places and you don't like to share your knowledge sometimes, but a country that people must visit, which one would it be for you? After this interview, I, I take profit that I have to search you because I would like to go to Mongolia. Okay. Yeah, yeah Mongolia is an extraordinary country with um, uh, incredible wildlife and, and that sensation of freedom because uh, lines are horizontal, not vertical, like, like in, in most of <laughs> now in most of the urban world. But um, uh, I'd like to go to. Well, you 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 asked me about what do I recommend? I recommend in China because I'm I'm, I'm specialized in China. In China, I recommend uh, Yunnan province is a very is a very unspoiled still com comparative com compared to other areas in China. It's still a very unspoiled um, and fascinating. Um, territory. But I'll let you go to, to, to some islands like Palau or Vanuatu in the Pacific that I haven't been to. Uh, those are very distant places and I, I like to discover. And also with a very um, um, particular culture and traditions. And, and especially because of the climate change, some of those areas, uh, areas are, disappear, maybe. Um, may disappear in the near future. Who knows? So it's, it's, there's also um, something metaphysical about it or I don't know how to describe it. And you know. also Sudan by the colors, because oh. the white is an impressive feeling that you can uh, take there. In Sudan? Yeah. Sudan, oh. yeah. And if I ask, uh, I have to ask about a book, a travel book. We know you both write uh, books uh, about traveling, but one book that it hasn't been written by you that you would uh, recommend to a our travel viewers? travel book, no? Yes. 
maybe Bangkok of Lawrence Osborne is another point of view about the, the life in Thailand and also because you think a lot that another ethic position in, uh, in, into other country is possible now, no? It's a very interesting writer. And not only for this, because he has a, another books that now are arriving to, to Catalonia, to Spain, and I think it, it's, a, it's a really discovery because he can explain the actual world with a very um, familiar and modern um, language. Well, it sounds good. No? Uh, well, anyway, before uh, finishing this uh, interview, uh, we would like to recommend viewers your own books. We have them here. Uh, China Fast Forward by Sergi Vicente and Las Defensas by uh, Gabi Martinez. Thank you so much for coming today. It's been a great pleasure. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. And Ana Priscilla, I'll see you next time. It's you been um, extremely interesting as usual. Thank you very much. When you hear her singing, it's fantastic. When you hear her playing the trumpet, it's sublime. In a few minutes, Andrea Motti's on our stage. And now let me introduce you to our weekly Home From Home. The protagonist is Elizabeth Bard from the United States. After finishing her university studies, she wanted to discover different cultures, so she went to work abroad as an au pair. She first went to Italy and now she's about to finish her stay in Catalonia. She has worked for a family in Argentona and there she has discovered the natural park of Fon Pican close to their home. Check it out. This is the Fon Pican in Ar Argentona near Mataró in Catalonia. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Barb and I'm from the United States. I'm working as an au pair in a family with three little boys, Tomas, Lucas and Mateo, and I am their English teacher. The Font Picant is maybe three minutes walk from the house, so there's a um, there's very nice uh, shaded area where we can play, uh, we play soccer, or there's, um, there's also benches, so when the boys are playing, um, I can just read or relax a little bit. Uh, and there's also uh, many trails around the Fonby Kent. And there are multiple, multiple fountains. And each one of them is a little bit different. Some of them have um, rock walls. And there's like little bridges, but they're all kind of tucked away in the mountain near the Fonby Kent. <laughs> On very clear days like this, it's absolutely the best time to go. Um, there's uh, multiple trails you can take to the, the Castle Buriac and I mean the castle itself is older than America which I obviously America is a very young country but being an American it's it's kind of surreal to see something uh, it's pretty it's very prominent here um, but it's very close also to the house to the Fon Picant and it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful hike. And I remember the first time that we went up on the hike, there was a tree and I had put my hand on it, but it was, it was a cork tree and I had never seen a cork tree in real life. And so I was like getting really excited. So I called the boys over. I was like, look at this, it's a cork tree. You know, with like the wine. And they were like, yeah, you know, a cork tree. This is, this is nothing new. So for me, I think, um, it's just, it's a beautiful hike up and then down, it's, it's very peaceful also. And I believe the Fon Picant, there was a, uh, a spa that used to be here. In, um, I think the translation into English is the spicy fountain. And because the, the water has like a, it's like slightly bubbly. And so when I'm finished with my hike, I come to the Font Picant and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little pump with the water so you can just, and it's delicious. It's the best water in Argentona, so. All this nature surrounding you, it's just, it's, it's quite special to me. I love it. I, I feel very at home here. 
and I think I, I only have one and a half months left, and so I'm trying to take, trying to savor, you know, all of the the time that I have left here with the family and the just the beauty that there really is around. So one of the best things about being an au pair is making these, I think, lifelong friendships with the, the families and also I've made many friends in Arkansas. I'm definitely coming back. Our next guest is from Barcelona, but she has become a true global phenomenon. After her first solo album, Emotional Dance, this jazz performer has managed to attract the attention of audiences and the media in countries as demanding as the United States and Japan. Andrea Motis, Hello. it's a pleasure to have you at the Weekly Mag. Thank you very much for me too. How are the gigs going? It's really, really going very, very well. And I'm very glad that every, every place we, can, we go, the, the audience is very happy and we can feel uh, there are just fans anywhere in the world mm -hmm. and also we always have fun any country we go and it's really a, a beautiful uh, job we have I feel as a musician. Mm -hmm. Let's talk uh, about your beginnings. You started uh, the Escola Municipal uh, de Musica de San Andreu with uh, Juan Chamorro mm -hmm. and shortly after I think you were 13 more or less he proposed you to become part of the band San mm -hmm. Andreu Jazz Band. Um, do you remember that moment? How did you feel? What was it like? Yes, because the, the San Andreas band was just starting and it was, uh, we went to see them at the first really kind of official gig that was in the Fe Terrassa Jazz Festival. Yes. And it was at the Jazz and La Nova Jazz Cabo. And it was uh, in, a, in a part of the festival that's from young, really youth, young men. For young people, no? Yes. And we went to see them before being myself in the band with my father and we were really amazed for, for the, the, the project and the, the, the songs that they were playing because it was really a high level, m much higher than the rest of the bands in the, and combos in the music school. So I was very happy when Joan proposed me to come in because it was for me really a challenge. I was also the youngest uh, girl in the band. In the band. And yes, I, it was very exciting for me because I knew also that Joan was always was only working in this band with with the students that were more dedicated to the music and were more motivated for doing that. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that there was a lot of extra rehearsals and extra hours and weekends for that for the concerts. But it was kind of educational but professional at the same time mm -hmm. and that's why I was very interested in that. Mm, and it was worth it. Um, how old were you when you started playing the trumpet? I started at seven with a great teacher called Tony Gallard at the, the same school. Mm, okay, let's talk about your uh, album, your first solo album actually called Emotional Dance. Um, you recorded it in New York mm -hmm. with the we could say, I think, legendary uh, label Impulse. Yes. Um, is it true that you're actually the first um, Catalan artist to record with Impulse? Uh, I never checked it out, uh, really, but uh, it seems to we, be. It's, it's what we've been told. <laughs> okay, yes, for me too. It's, it seems to be because not, ma not many uh, artists from other, other places than the US have recorded, at least in the past, for, mm -hmm. for Impulse. Although nowadays uh, I know that they are working with many artists around the world mm -hmm. and that's one of, of their challenge nowadays to, to, to catch jazz from all around, more than only the States. But in the past it used to be a, a very impulse, impulsive <laughs> or... <laughs> a, a, um, Never said better, no? A, a level that, that was a helping kind of music that was not the most popular one. It was for the... Um, um, daring. For daring artists. Yes, for daring uh, artists. Tell us, um, um, what kind of songs did you choose for this album? We chose, I, I, uh, I wanted to choose the songs that, that we could really um, play better. Because we, we've been playing swing music and old jazz from a lot of time. And this was 
This is one of the of the type of music that appears more in a CD. For example, the single of the album and the first song also is the "He's Funny That Way." It's a uh, truly uh, swing and old music. It's from Billie Holiday, from the the ear, early Billie Holiday sessions, and it's really one of the not very known songs that I like to to put in life again, <laughs> again, and. <clears throat> and the rest is also kind of a little bit of Brazilian music, like Chega Saudade. And also we have a little bit of hard bop. And also for the first time we have original songs in this album. One from the Ignacy de Terraza on piano. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one, of, one is written by Perico Sambea, the great alto saxophonist from Valencia. And three are written for myself for the first time record. Mm -hmm. and and also, it's there are for the first time three songs in Catalan. Mm -hmm. A very eclectic uh, album indeed. Uh, well, you play the trumpet and the saxophone. You're a singer and now a composer. Mm -hmm. Tell us about uh, lyrics. What kind of stories uh, do they tell? Um, I wrote my lyrics myself for two of my songs, and the third one is without lyrics. It's only instrumental. And the, the two lyrics I wrote, the first one is a ballad and talks a little bit of of a not very happy sensation, like more when you're working hard and and you're doing all of yourself or putting t to the others and you feel like you don't have time for yourself. This is one perspective <laughs> that okay, sometimes so appears in any profession. Okay, and so inspiration from your, your own life, no? Yes. Things that you've lived. Yes, although it's most of the time very, very happy to have a creative career. But you know, this is one of the, the sensations that inspired me for the first song. And for the second song, I used a Latin climo. And this talks about a friend, a very friendly relation and very special relation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, Andrea, we'd like to know your taste is a little bit better. That's why we prepared a set of quick questions. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. You need to choose one option. Frank Sinatra or Nat King Cole? Ah, very difficult one. Wow. <laughs> I would say today, just today, Nat King Cole. Why not? Excellent. Billy Holiday or Ella Fitzgerald? Maybe for today, Ella Fitzgerald, but I love both. Louis Armstrong or Miles Davis? Louis Armstrong today. <laughs> <laughs> trumpet or voice? Maybe trumpet. I need to, to, to practice hard. And your favorite jazz standard? <clears throat> One of my favorites I was remembering yesterday is Chelsea Bridge. Good choice. Tell us about your next gigs. I know you have a, a busy summer ahead, ahead of you. Yes. I'm going to California uh, at the, the middle of July until the middle of August in a beautiful place that's the, the, the Stanford Jazz Workshop. And I was there last year and I really had a lot of fun there teaching um, very young people. And it was very, very, fun, very funny. And this year I'm going there again and I'm bringing my group too to play there. And after that we'll, we're going to do a little tour there. So I'm very excited for that. It's the first tour in the States we're doing. Wow. Um, what project are you working on at the moment? A new album um, maybe? Yes, I'm working on a new album that it's going to be called probably Brazil. And mm -hmm. it's going to be all Brazilian music. We have already recorded it, most of the album, in April. Mm -hmm. But I am going to finish it very, very nearly. Very, Sounds very really soon. good. Yes. Well, Andrea, you're here today with us. You, you uh, brought your sister, mm -hmm. Carla, yes. who is an excellent guitar player. And you're going to um, perform together on stage, on the stage of the Weekly Mag. What song are you going to perform? Which is one of the songs that we're recording for Carla's album that's coming next year or at the end of this year. And by the way, we are recording on the 23rd of, of June in the Jamboree. Mm -hmm. So you can come and hear the recording live. And we are going to play this song that's called Afro Blue from Mongo Santa Maria. Mm. Looking forward to it. Andrea, it's been a great pleasure to have you here with Thank us. You. And while Andrea prepares her trumpet for this performance, I propose some tips about phrasal verbs from our International House Barcelona professor, Jan Nicholson. Here they are. Uh, 
Hi, as you're getting ready to travel, I have some phrasal verbs for you to keep in mind to help you on your journey. It's five in the morning and your suitcase is packed. You're ready to head out the door. As you head out, you get in the taxi and once he starts moving, you set off on your journey. When the taxi arrives to the airport, he will drop you off. After he helps you with your luggage, you will stroll your cart to the airline company so that you can check in. Everybody must register before their flight. And when you get to the hotel, you will also check in. And when you leave, you will check out. But once you've checked into the airport and you've passed the security control, there will be boarding, which means you can get on the airplane. Once everybody has been seated and their seat belts have been fastened, the airplane will start moving. Once you get on the runway, keep your fingers crossed as the airplane will start speeding up or accelerating till it finally takes off. As you leave the airport behind, you will be getting away and leaving all your work-related stress and that annoying garbage truck that wakes you up every night behind. It's important after a long flight to stretch your legs out once you get to your hotel. I recommend to walk around or take a look around to see if you can find some good restaurants to eat nearby. Make sure to take advantage of every moment because when you're having fun, time flies by. And before you know it, it'll be time to go back. It's the most dreaded part of a journey, but I hope you had a lot of fun and you'll have great stories and pictures to show your friends and family when you're finally home. Enjoy your trip. Goodbye. Dream of a land my soul is from I hear a hand stoke on a drum Shades of the light Poco hue Rich as the night Afro blue Elegant boy Beautiful girl Dancing for joy Elegant world Shades of the light Coco hue Rich as the night Afro blue Lovers dance face to face With undulating grace They gently sway and slip away To some secluded place Shades of the light Coco hue Rich as the night Afro blue He likes suitcases. He prefers backpacks. Luckily, Patricia Scalona and Matthew Tree don't travel together often. In a few minutes, they'll be arguing in our face-off. And we go on with music, because our next protagonist is also a musician. 
Her name is Chris Rosa. She was born and raised in New York, where she studied clarinet, musical theater, guitar, jazz, and Afro-Caribbean percussion. She has worked both as a teacher and as a performer for over 20 years. Currently, she runs with her husband the music studio Biri Bop, uh, where the light motive is to get the music into your bones. My name is Chris Rosa. One of the biggest passions in my life is music. My parents are both music lovers. My mother listened to um, a lot of jazz, and my father is a big music fan too, and he's, he plays as well. He plays guitar and sings. He's, uh, he's got a band as well and plays gigs. And growing up, I just always felt attracted to it. It wasn't anything um, strange or odd. It was just very natural. I was always singing songs. I even composed my first songs when I was, I think, six years old. When I was in primary school, uh, I started playing the clarinet. That was my first instrument. When I was a teenager, I decided that clarinet was not for me anymore. And I picked up the guitar. Which one? I felt so passionate about it, it just felt so right um, that I decided to, to study as well at, at university. In college, my guitar teacher would always talk about Barcelona because he used to come here often. So when I had the opportunity to do some traveling, which I had always wanted to do, I decided um, instead of going uh, to a lot of different places, just like two days here, two days there, which a lot of people do, I said, no, I want to go one place and really get to know that place and stay for a month. I really liked it. Things really clicked. I, I, made, a lot of, I made a lot of friends. Um, and so I would go back and forth between New York and Barcelona. There was about a year where I was going back and forth at that time. I ended up meeting somebody and getting involved in a relationship too. Um, so little by little I started to have more of a life here and so I decided to come and, and try out living here for a while. And so what we do uh, are concerts with different types of projects, things for adults, things for the whole family. We do a lot of family-oriented uh, shows. We do workshops uh, in companies, at schools, classes in schools, extracurricular. Um, and so basically Bidi Bop is just musical services of all different types for people of all ages who want to learn and enjoy music. <laughs> How um, powerful music is, it can make you feel lots of different things. Um, it can make you feel great, it can also make you feel not so great. There are, there's music that really invites you to be more introspective or to feel things that are not so pleasant. It's very rich because it's got all of the human experiences and emotions, so it makes you feel a lot of things. But I definitely think that it lifts your spirit in some way. Today our face-off section revolves around two objects and what they represent. On one hand, the backpack, and on the other, the suitcase. Each of these objects implies a way of traveling, and that is precisely what our usual contenders will argue about today. One of them defends the concept of backpack, and the other, the concept of suitcase. Patricia Scalona and Matthew Tree, welcome back. Thank you very much. Ready to argue? Yeah, indeed. Yes. Always. <laughs> As always. So, Patricia, I bet I would say you are a fan of comfort. 
Oh yeah, when <laughs> big traveling. Time. <laughs> big time, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the point of um, suffering when you're traveling. I, um, I don't know, maybe I grew up reading about these big, this, these books about traveling in the 19th century when, you know, English families took like everything from their china to the china sets to um, their dresses and they just installed themselves in these massive villas in the Toscana and that's I think what um, in a way informed the way I thought about traveling mm. so comfort and some sort of luxury and enjoyment basically. Mm -hmm. Okay what yeah. about you Matthew? I um, would say I you love backpacks. Uh, no, actually, I was going to say no. I don't. I don't <laughs> particularly like backpacks, but I don't like the whole concept of sort of hotel tourism because we can mm. see it here in Barcelona. You can see it in the city of Girona, which is probably the other Catalan city which has most tourists. There are whole areas now where, if you live in the city, you can't go into those areas because there's so much tourism. And what tourism does is, especially tourism with money, is it puts the prices up and the quality goes down. So you, you, don't, you eat and drink uh, less well and you pay more for that lack of quality. What's your idea of the perfect holiday? I don't like being a tourist at <laughs> all. So if I go somewhere, I like to have at least something to do or someone to meet. It doesn't have to be someone important or for work or anything like that. But, but just a local. A contact, a local, yeah. So I go there and I try and find out what's happening there. I try and learn a little bit of the language, even if it's uh, to give two real cases, Swahili or Czech, for example, just enough to ask for things and stuff like that. Oh, show off. And even... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than being boring. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you remember that. still yeah, wrinkles, that you know, I still remember that. And also one thing I do, and this is just, uh, uh, for, for I always buy the newspapers from those countries, um, partly also to stop myself being mugged or attacked in the street. I've found that if you carry a copy of a local newspaper, uh, they, they don't treat you like a tourist. Oh, that's a good tip. They don't put the prices up, they don't uh, try and cheat on yeah, you. Right. Uh, you think that uh, they are like uh, very touristic, and you don't, uh, you can't have an authentic experience in a country if you carry a. I associate suitcase. them with hotels, and the thing is, with hotels, hotels tend to isolate you from from the country that you're in because it's like a little world of its own. And if you go to an African country, the, for example, in Dar es Salaam, I mean, there are hotels that are like fortresses. You know, they're just there for the tourists, and they're guarded by security guards. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you're living in this little enclosed world and you don't really feel that you're living in, in that country. Whereas if you stay in a, a, even in a, a, a pension, pensione, pension in Spanish, yes. I, I, uh, bed That's and breakfast, a, I suppose. Yeah, it's it a difficult be. word. At least you get hmm. more contact with, with, the, with the people there. And it, it doesn't depend as much on, on whether you're staying in a hotel or an apartment. But it, I think it does depend on your attitude towards traveling. So, attitude. Yeah, hmm. your attitude. And you, the capacity, as you were saying about the paper, I, I support that. I think, I think you're right about that. But that can only happen in places where you can um, pass for one of them. I mean, I've been in Africa as well, and no matter where I stayed, it's impossible. They were going to know that I'm not from there. Of course, you know, yeah. I look the way I look. Um, but I remember being in Venice on my own. I did this little travel and I stayed in a hotel. Uh, I was in the center of town and I came out on the street one day and I went to have a coffee. And it was, I speak Italian, so I was speaking to them, not, not in their dialect, but they thought I was Italian for whatever reason. Um, and they charged, you know, these English people that were like by my side, three euros per coffee and me a euro for my coffee, for my black coffee. So they thought I was. So that, that became an, an authentic experience in a way, you know, because they thought I was Italian and I passed for Italian. I didn't tell them they were wrong because what for? It was much more fun. Mm -hmm. 
And then I found this other restaurant where, you know, where people were eating, people from Venice, from actual families. So I, and I stayed there for hours just listening to their conversation. So it was my attitude that changed the whole thing. I never set foot on San Marco. I never set foot on, you know, many places that tourists are supposed to go and see. So that's, okay. and I still was traveling with my suitcase with four wheels and staying okay. in a hotel. With your trolley. Yeah. Um, talking about authentic experiences, um, hitchhiking. Are you for or against? I've only hitchhiked in emergencies, to be honest. Uh, but not for any particular reason, but because I prefer public transport when I move around. I prefer to get a bus or a train uh, because hitchhiking can be really irregular. Um, a lot of people, and, and now in fact, I hardly, you hardly ever see hitchhikers at all, at least here in uh, It used Catalonia. to be very popular though. It used to be very popular. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd just like to say before we go on that actually I'm in total agreement with Patricia <laughs> about, that's, that's the <laughs> about the business of using, of using language because I've found that that's always been the key. Um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned speaking Italian and, they, uh, and, and going to Africa as well. And obviously when I, I spent a long week, that's the longest time I've, I've, I've been in Africa, like a long week in Tanz uh, Tanzania. And I tried to learn as much Swahili as I could, like I said. And at the end of the trip, I could sort of, you know, it was sort of normal for me to use Swahili to buy stuff. And mm -hmm. I remember I was in a, a little village about 100, mm, 100 kilometers outside of the capital, Dar es Salaam, or if the official capital is somewhere else, but it doesn't matter. And I wanted to buy a newspaper. So I went up to this newspaper kiosk, and in Swahili, I asked for a a paper and uh, asked how much it cost and and the guy without even looking at me just gave me the price in Swahili and although I was the only white Excellent. person within a sort of radius of I don't know how many uh, hundreds of kilometers it's almost like he was just treating me normally like those people in Venice were treating you normally because you were speaking Italian. Mm -hmm. Okay well time is um, over for today and as usual Patricia has been much more convincing, Matthew. Um, I'm sorry. Really Don't man. get offended. Sorry to buy you a drink or something at the end of you all know, this. We really need to tell viewers that in this uh, section, this program is not fixed because Patricia always wins. <laughs> but you ha still have an opportunity next week. Right. How many programs have we got left? <laughs> two, actually. Two. 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 Okay. Got two okay. Chances. So we've got two all more right. chances. Well, thank you both for coming. Thank Until you next so much. time. <laughs> And the weekly mic comes to an end. Thank you all so much for watching us. And remember, you can find us on social networks at, at the weekly mag TV. In our next show, we'll be dealing with the subject of humor. So uh, this week's quote is a perfect fit. These are the words of one of the most popular comedians in the United States, Jerry Seinfeld. See you next week. And as always, Remember to keep your English up and running.